What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas and this is BDGE. And yes, we are in the new studio. We are in the new office space. I feel like I'm going to say that to you guys for the next like six months. It's going to be fucking August. And I'm going to be like, we just got a new studio. But yes, we are in uh we are in our actual office space. We have semi moved in. It's 1030 a.m. and the employees aren't here yet. I'm going to be doing a lot of firing today. Okay. But my main focus before I could fire people is to make some fire content for you guys. We're recapping the NFL Combine as it relates to the running back position. Last week, myself and uh, Ray GQ did a long, wonderful, beautiful featured film recapping the Combine as it related to the first day. Quarterbacks, wide receivers, tight ends. So if you missed that, link will be in the description. I, I suggest you go check that out. We're talking about NFL Combine running backs. The winners, the losers, guys who have moved up the draft board, moved down the draft board because they're slow and they're small and their name is Kyron Williams or they're big and they're fast and their name is Brees Hall. We're going through the entire spectrum of what happened on that turf. There is new turf. I want to say a few things. Actually, we'll get into those things after the intro because a lot of y'all are rude as fuck and skip the intros and then start listening afterwards. So if I put important shit prior to the intro, then you guys don't hear it and I need you to hear the most important shit. Shout out Calvin Ridley the GOAT. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. I think I might just do the shit. Shakira. From now on, instead of the less eat part, I want everybody at home to tuck their shirts in and do and do this at me if you're watching me on you. Okay, get the fuck. Right. Okay, so a, a few uh, ground notes I want to go over as it relates to the running back position at the combine this year. There was some wacky shit happening. Okay, we saw the. 40 times for the wide receivers just absolutely shoot to Mars. Fucking Jupiter, Venus. I don't know which one's the furthest away, but whatever whatever the planet is the furthest away, Pluto, that's not a planet anymore. That's where these 40 times for the wide receivers shot. It was because there's there's someone that does the... Un, there's someone that literally sits there and does a timer, like an unofficial timer when these players run. I don't know why they waste their time doing it when they're going to go back and do the official 40 times. Anyways, I guess it's probably for degenerates like us that want to watch and know it. Immediately, even though it's not accurate whatsoever. So they changed the unofficial 40-timer person for the first time in, I think it was like 15 years or whatever. So they had a new guy, which was why the wide receiver times were so off. Right, like Chris Olave's coming out here running a 4-2-6. Like, get the fuck up out of here. You know what I'm saying? Being a 4-2-6 guy. They tape. They reverted it to a 4-3-7 official time. With the running backs, they clearly tried to adjust for that. And they were a little heavier on the finger which led to them timing people way higher than they actually came in at. So you had Kyron Williams coming in at 472. Official time, I think, was like 465, whatever it is, right? I will be the first to say I don't believe for a second that these official times are actually accurate, okay, for the first time ever. It was just simply too much speed on the field to actually believe that the, like, the unofficial times were so far off. They were, everyone came in way too fucking fast. Something fishy is going on here. Now, I have two theories for this three theories also none of the running backs ran the agility drills they none of them did the short sprints or whatever the 20 yard shuttle the whatever yard shuttle and there's a little bit of breakdown there as well so just bear with me because this is going to be a long video so apparently there's new turf on the field there in indy brand new turf which is faster turf or whatever they've had on the field prior to that uh was not suitable for the 40 or it was slow turf consider some shit like that i don't know how true that is but if it's true and they just put that in this offseason, Jonathan Taylor might run for 5,000 fucking 200 yards next year. Okay, so 101, Jonathan Taylor. 101, Brees Hall. Guy comes in at 439, 40-yard dash time. That could be true. The other thing, the other storyline, narrative, conspiracy theory that might be going on here is no running back ran the agility drill. That could be for one of two reasons. And would all one of the reasons would also explain why the 40 times are so high. The 40-yard dash is so technique-based, right? You could learn to be better at the 40-yard dash. You don't actually have to, like, you can go from a 4-5 guy to a 4-4-5 guy over the course of a month without getting faster, but just getting better at technique. And the 40-yard dash is the most important thing for the, uh, the running backs at the combine. So what I've heard is that they are intensely focusing on the technique and learning how to run the 40-yard dash. 
And that's why they skip the agility drills because they say, hey, I'll do the 40-yard dash at the NFL Combine. That will be my sole focus for the next month to make sure I crack in at the 4 4 or whatever it is. And then over the next three to four weeks, my pro day comes and I will work on the agility drills. Therefore, I could have the best of both worlds and not do the other drills once the uh, once I'm tired and once I've been waiting there and once I've done all the other shit or whatever. And I could focus on two separate things as I'm learning how to do them technique-wise. So that was theory number one. And that makes a lot of sense. Theory number two is literally because they decided to televise the combine at night on the weekend and the running backs were the last position group to go, they simply ran out of time. It got really, really late and they called it off and they said, we don't have time to do the agility drills because it's late, y'all are tired, we need to go home, we need to wrap this thing up. This was this is a legitimate like article report that I saw on Twitter. And that also makes sense. That pro- actually probably makes more sense to me because what are the chances that 30 running backs not a single one of them wanted to do the agility drills. That just feels like too high of a coincidence for that to actually happen. So, you know, we have years and years and years and years of people doing the agility drills at the combine. And then all of a sudden, literally not a single one of them wants to do it. I can understand if the trend was moving more towards running your 40 and then doing the pro day agility drills. But for the fact that they all just opted out, they all just decided to do it the exact same year. Seems weird. Seems a little I feel like we're doing too much there, okay? So that's a little bit too extra for me to believe. Therefore, I'm going to say that they actually did run out of time, but now they're all going to have to do it at their pro days, apparently. So we have we have no we have no agility scores on these combine metrics, which is unfortunate because it helps us put into perspective the different player comps that we can come out with from these rookie running backs. So we got a lot going on this year at the combine. It was almost a fucking movie in itself. A lot of conspiracies, a lot of narratives, a lot of fake news, all this nonsense, okay? But Regardless, we've got to go off the numbers that we have on hand. And I posted a long thread on Twitter on March 5th, which is three days ago. Make sure you are following me on the Twitter. Uh, And I think what I'm going to do is kind of narrate through this. And that will probably pick apart most of the takeaways and the winners and the losers and things like that. And we will touch on other players as we go through. So my first thought was... Uh, The NFL Combine doesn't change a whole lot for me in terms of positional rankings, which is probably not true. Running backs moved up and down based on the rankings, but it did help shape what rookie drafts are going to look like this year, okay? So at this point, we have a lot of information. We have a player's college production. We have their stats. We have whether or not they're early declares. We have their versatility. And now we have their athletics. So we know who they are as a player. The only piece of the puzzle we don't have, which is, of course, a huge piece of the puzzle, is NFL draft capital and landing spots. A lot of the time you can start to project based on all the information we have at hand where the draft capital is going to end up being, right? Like now that we have athletics and production all in one cocktail mixed together, you have a good idea. You know, you have the ingredients. There's no way that cocktail comes out as a Moscow mule when you put the ingredients for a fucking margarita. You know what I'm saying? So like second round ingredients are not going to come out looking like fifth round ingredients, cocktail wise. I don't know if that made any sense, but it makes a lot of sense in my head. So we have a lot of the picture already painted, right? And it's like, oh, well, we have to wait for draft capital. It's like, well, we know basically what a player is up to this point. So we have a good idea of where their draft capital is going to end up being. Maybe not to a T, but for a lot of it. So we could start to look at super flex rookie drafts. We could start to feel out the different pockets of where player values are going to go. And I think like most years, like the first 10 picks will be heavily occupied by the elite running backs. So we have like Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, uh, probably still Isaiah Spiller, and then we have the elite wide receivers. I think they're Drake London, Traylon Burks, and Garrett Wilson. And then you'll have the first round quarter, the first round NFL draft quarterbacks will go likely in the first round of super flex draft. So you have Malik Willis, you have Kenny Pickett, you probably have Matt Corral, and then you have one, if not two, of like Sam Howell, Carson Strong, and Desmond Ritter. So that will occupy like the first 10 to 11 picks. After that, you have that typical vi- uh, pocket of value wide receivers that, you know, I don't think they're necessarily elite, but they're really, really good players and they're really hard to pass on. Some of them have a few more red flags, you know, like Jamison Williams might, might've been a guy who you'd consider a top like seven rookie pick, but he's dealing with the ACL injury. So that knocks him down the board a little bit. You don't know if you're going to get him at all for his rookie season. So after those first 10 picks, you have that value pocket of wide receivers where it's like, Chris Olave, George Pickens, uh, Jameson Williams, Jahan Dotson, Christian Watson, you know, whoever you want, you know, that pocket of guys that we've seen the last three years. Like last year, it was uh, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, 
uh, both Moores, Elijah Moore, Rondell Moore, Rashad Bateman, just really good players that tend to go in like the 111 to the 203 spot, right? In that four or five spot where the elite players are off the board or the really valuable players in terms of like quarterback and positional value are gone, but the wide receivers are sitting there. So I see that happening. Um, and then we start to move towards players where you kind of just like like players and you take your shot on them. And because the combine, the, the way I looked at the combine for this year, the running backs came away way more athletic than we could have asked for. And again, I feel like the 40 times are fucking skewed. Not ain't everybody running a four, five or a four, four or a fucking four, three. There was like nine guys that ran four threes. Like that's just not, that doesn't happen. Okay. So I'm taking these with a grain of salt, but these are the only numbers that we can actually work off of. Y'all know I've been really, really high on Rashad White's all off season. And he was my RB4 pre-combine. He did absolutely everything at the combine to walk away as my RB4 for the remainder of the off season as long as he gets good draft capital, and he should, because he came in at six foot, 214 pounds. So we're talking about real workhorse size for an NFL running back here. 448 40 yard dash puts him in the 83rd percentile for speed score. He did the fucking vert, he did the broad jump, and he came away as an 86th percentile explosive burst type athlete. So he hit the fucking nail on the head for every piece of testing. You have Rashad White, who is fantastic in the passing. And as you can see, his college target share of 18.9% in the 98th percentile is just ridiculous. So now you have a size speed specimen that can play on all three downs. Rashad White, one of my favorite players in this prospect profile draft class. Now, of course, we'd be remiss not to talk about the guys at the top of the totem pole. And that is, of course, Mr. Brees Hall, who, listen, I mean, if you believe these athletics, if you believe that the testing time was correct, his athleticism is bordering on Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor levels. 5'11", 217, workhorse size, 20 years old right now. Guy runs a 4'39", which puts him in the 98th percentile for speed score, burst score in the 94th percentile. Now, that is something that you cannot fake, right? The vertical jump, the broad jump, does not matter who's looking, does not matter who's measuring, does not matter the type of turf. That is the same no matter where you do it, no matter how you do it. So these burst scores are good to see that they're up there because they're legit no matter how you fucking look at it. So he comes away as a wildly, wildly athletic player. And you mix that with just his pure, you know, I've said this a lot, but like Brees Hall is just so wholesome as a runner. He reminds me of Aaron Jones. If you gave Aaron Jones 20 pounds on his frame, 15 pounds on his frame, a guy who could catch the ball, college target share in the 80th percentile. He can do it on all three downs. He is going to be the RB1 in this class. He is going to be a workhorse in the NFL at the next level. I guess I'm a little bit hesitant to say he will be the first running back off the board because there's a guy named Kenneth Walker who I think will compete with Brees Hall for the RB1 in terms of NFL draft capital. Now, Brees Hall, for me, comes away from the combine as the clear 101 in every format of rookie drafts. Super flex, premiums, it don't, full PPR, don't fucking matter. Brees Hall is the guy for me. But you have Kenneth Walker, who also came in with a ridiculous 40 time, 4-3-8 40 time, puts him in the 96th percentile in terms of speed score. And my man Ray GQ said it best, but there ain't no fucking way Kenneth Walker is faster than Jonathan Taylor, which is, an, again, why I'm like, dude, these 40 times are whacked. These 40 times have been twisted. Someone sprinkled a little fairy dust in whoever's cocktail was mixing these shits up. But Kenneth Walker, 5'9", 211, 4'3", 8", 40-yard dash. Love to see it. Obviously, there's questions in the passing game because he did not have the involvement at the college level, but I could see the reason I'm hesitant to say Brees Hall is the RB1 off the board He's, uh, he's clearly my RB1 in fantasy, and I would take him as an NFL manager, as a fucking GM, obviously. Kenneth Walker seems like a guy who an NFL team would fall in love with, okay? I don't know if that's going to actually make him have higher draft capital than Brees Hall, but I could see both of them going in the second round now, and maybe some team just likes Walker as a pure runner better than Brees Hall, fits their scheme, all that bullshit that they like to go through. So Walker, another obviously big winner at the combine, running a 4-3-8. Then we have the next running back in this class who we've had a lot of chatter about on the BDGE interwebs, and that's Mr. Isaiah Spiller, man. So Isaiah Spiller opted not to run, okay? Opted not to run. The His agent came out and said some shit like he was dealing with an abdomen strain. He opted not to run, but he did the jumps. He did the vertical jump. He did the broad jump. So something's fishy there. I just think he's going to be fucking slow. Okay. And we've been BDG way lower than consensus on Isaiah Spiller. And we're looking like we're going down the right fucking track right now. He weighs in what we thought he would be six foot two seventeen. All right. So he's not the two twenty five He was listed at, but he's basically the same size as Brees Hall. That's workhorse size 20 years old. So you love that. The burst score in the seventh percentile, the seventh. So no, we didn't see the 40 yard dash time. And I don't think it's going to be that good. Okay. 
I think he's going to run somewhere in the high four fives, uh, even crack the four sixes, which is not a death blow by any means. But you start to paint the picture of Isaiah Spiller. We already had questions about him as a pure runner. And now you start to take away the athleticism a little bit, right? We don't have the 40 time. We don't have the speed score. But that burst score, man, that is, mm, that is uh, you know, trending in the wrong direction for Mr. Isaiah Spiller at the moment. So we'll wait for the pro day, but it ain't looking good for, for all y'all that had Spiller as your fucking RB1. And no, we're not going to victory lap having Brees Hall as our RB1 because uh, anyone who didn't have Brees Hall as their RB1 pre-combine just simply wasn't running on the on the same track as we were to begin with. So we have Rashad White as the RB4. Let's continue down this Twitter thread. Before the combine, sitting at like the 206 or later in your rookie drafts, was looking about as ugly as an animal paint job. But just like animals paint job, it finished strong and it looks quite beautiful. Now, after all the combine testing, we have hella good athletes in this class at the wide receiver position, at the running back position. But you start to look at this class as a whole, the size, speed, burst combination at the running back position, and ah, it's chef's kiss at the 205 and later. If you have those middle round picks stacked up, you get to target a ton of really high upside running backs in this class that kind of fall into that Damian Harris prototype where they're not flashy, but they have workhorse size, they have good speed scores, but more importantly, these high burst scores, which separates you having good vision and being able to turn that into an 8 to 14 yard run. And those continuously pile up over and over and over again. Okay. So when we're looking at this class objectively and their athleticism, there is a ton, a ton, a ton to like here, which makes me way more comfortable with those middle round picks, right? Because now you're shooting at guys like last year, it was like, yeah, I want to get Kenny Gainwell at the 206. We have seven guys that are Kenny Gainwells this year. We have like so many guys that are small, undersized, good at catching passes that are more athletic than Kenny Gainwell. This is this has turned into a much, much stronger class of the running back position than last year's class, okay? So we will start to continue down the actual prospects themselves. Some winners that I would I would say are winners, at least. Uh, we have Brian Robinson out of Alabama. So long speed ain't his game. He's not a guy who breaks away big runs. He's a, he's a bruiser, right? 225 fucking pounds, six foot two. But his 85th percentile speed score, pretty sexy. What I will say, when you look at a, a profile like this, this is not a great profile to have uh, in terms of like pure relative upside as... as to how people are probably going to take this. You see that burst or you see that speed score and you're like, oh, that's, you know, it's beautiful. You love a guy who's 225 pounds that can hit the hole and break away big plays. He doesn't do that. We never saw him do that. So let's not pretend like this fake 40 yard dash time is going to turn him into a sprinter all of a sudden. That burst score is concerning to me. Very concerning to me because what the high speed score says is that if I have a very wide running lane, I can take that and turn it into a 20 or 30 yard run. Having small, uh, having a lower burst score tells me, that, again, if there's a small lane that can get you into the secondary, you might not be able to hit that. You might not be able to turn those three-yard runs into eight, 10, and 12-yard runs, right? It's not going to be easy for you to bust off the 18, eight to 15-yard runs, but if you have a very wide lane, you could turn those into 15, 20, 25-yard runs. That's what the 40-yard dash tells me and whether or not you can hit the long home run speed, okay? So, that is more situationally based, which makes me a little bit nervous about a profile like him. Although I would say, listen, it's it's better to see. I didn't think he was going to test that as a great athlete. So it's better to see that he has the speed score than not at 225 pounds. So I think this will make a team in the NFL fall in love with him and probably pick him at the end of day two or early day two, third round or something like that, which obviously puts him on fantasy radars. With your own four, he weighed in a little bit. Uh, less than we thought he was. And that was at the Senior Bowl anyway, so we kind of knew that. 5'11", 210 pounds, similar profile, where the speed score, 446, 83rd percentile speed score is there, but the burst score is, is bad, man. Jerome Ford, like Brian Robinson, not the most elusive guys. I personally were, was not really a big fan of either of these guys coming out of college. But again, it's it's there to say that if there's a, a wide running lane, then, uh, then he can make something happen. And that is something that we did see at the college level. He did break away a, a lot of big plays at 446. You're going to be able to do that. But he's not particularly big. He's not elusive. The burst score is really, really poor. Uh, so we don't necessarily love that. James Cook, also not a guy I'm like truly, truly in love with. Listen, he's no fucking Dalvin Cook. Not even close to the player that Dalvin Cook is. He won't be a three-down player at the next level. 5'11", 199, 8th percentile BMI score. So he is slimmer. He is smaller than most backs in the NFL. But he ran a 4'4'2", which gives him a really good speed score. Basically, I think he could be a really good third-down player. He is a, a very good pass catcher. Uh, shows true NFL speed 4-4-2, which means even if he has a limited role, limited opportunities, he could turn some of those limited opportunities into 
big plays. That's what his profile says to me athletically. We move on to Keontae Ingram out of USC. All right. I've heard almost nothing, no chirp about Keontae Ingram. Uh, our, our boy, the king, no more parties, who's been doing a fantastic job. He did a similar video to, to this yesterday on the channel. He loved Keontae Ingram. He actually said that he has a comp in the upper range of Alvin Kamara. And when I watched the film, I got it. You know, I wasn't sure how athletic he'd come away, but this dude weighed in at 221 pounds, six foot tall, four, five, three, 40 yard dash, puts him in the 79th percentile for speed score, burst score above average. So you're looking at above average, if not really good athletic athleticism across the board. So keep an eye on Keonta Ingram. I have no idea where he's going to go in the draft. It's probably going to be later in the draft. So he becomes like a, you know, kind of like a dart throw. But, you know, if this guy's profile was in last year's class, you'd be drafting him at the end of the second round, no doubt. He would have he would have went ahead of, ahead of guys like Kenny Gainwell and the shit guys you were, you were taking at the end of the second round. So, Keontae Ingram's profile is very, very intriguing to me, as is Ty Chandler. Uh, again, I apologize, Ray G, if you watch this. We did the live stream last week recapping the wide receivers and shit at the Combine. Ray G told me to watch Ty Chandler's tape, North Carolina product. And that was before the combine. Then the combine happened, and this dude ran a 4.38. 5'11", 204 pounds. That speed score is really, really high. Again, another guy with this profile where the burst score is not there. And that's another reason that I'm a little bit skeptical about these 40 times. Typically, listen, you run these 40 times, your burst score is usually like on par, at least like average, at least be an average burst score athlete when you're doing elite things at the 40-yard dash, which is why those don't line up to me. And you continue seeing this trend of really good 40-yard dashes with really low burst scores, which tells me something fishy is going on here. So Ty Chandler came in blazing the fucking 40. Uh, I did not get around to watching his film yet. So when I do, I'll probably throw out a Twitter thread on it. So make sure you're following me again at Nick Ercolano. Uh, and make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are enjoying the video you like some shits like this, you know, we get deep here, man. You might look at me and be like, this is a silly motherfucker. I can't believe I'm watching him yell about this stuff. But as you can see, I'm about the shits, man. I'm about the shits. I put the fucking work in. Ty Chandler, uh, let's move down to Kevin Harris. So Kevin Harris was a guy that I did not like. I believe my, uh, my notes, one of the first few things I said about Kevin Harris in my notes as I was watching the film was that this guy loves CTE. I f it felt like he had a magnet inside of his helmet where the positive side of the magnet was there and the negative side was on the defender's chest plate. This guy loved contact, especially head-on contact. It felt like he, his Xbox controller did not have the right joystick, like he was incapable of making guys miss. Not elusive whatsoever. Noah and Ray G, both of the aforementioned frauds, I might add, Loved Kevin Harris. Kevin Harris was a guy who dominated his sophomore year in the SEC. Senior year, I saw a different player on film, and I did not like what I saw. What I saw in my notes, though, which does line up with what we saw here, is when he did get a runaway lane, like those other guys, when he did get a big lane, he had real long speed. So when you give a guy that's 221 pounds, 5'10", 221, there's so many guys built like this in this class, man. It gets so fucking intriguing. All of the... All of the uh, players in the NFL right now that are, you know, backups or third, fourth string guys that are small or undersized or not fast are going to get wiped out by the depth at this class. Kevin Harris, 21 years old, burst score in the 89th percentile. So he is an explosive athlete. He did not run the 40 yard dash, which I wish he did. But like I said, on film, he was a breakaway player, which tells me that at his pro day, he probably will run a pretty fast 40 yard dash for a 221 pound player, which will give him a really, really athletic profile. You mix the athletic profile with the size and the college production in the SEC, and you're probably looking at an L for your boy. So we will adjust, and Kevin Harris becomes a very, very intriguing guy that you're probably looking at at the end of the second round. Pierre Strong is another winner from this class. South Dakota State product, and I literally just watched his film this morning, so we have some fresh, hot-off-the-oven takes from your mans. South Dakota State, 5'11", 207, runs a 4'3", 740-yard dash. 94th percentile speed score, which is even more impressive when you're 207 pounds. It's easy to get in the higher percentile speed scores when you're 220, because all you got to do is run like a 4'5", 5'. Very impressive what Pierre Strong did. 75th percentile burst score, so you're just looking at an all-around explosive athlete. When I watch Pierre Strong, I was talking about, I was talking about Pierre Strong to Brett Coleman this morning in the DMs. And Brett Coleman basically said like, listen, we're pivoting away from Zaquandre White. We did a video a week or two ago about his top five like deeper prospect guys that we're going to love in this year's class. It was like Christian Watson. It was Calvin Austin. It was uh, Zaquandre White. Zaquandre White didn't test. But Brett Coleman was like, listen, we're replacing Zaquandre White with 
Pierre Strong as our favorite late round running back. He comped Pierre Strong to this year's Elijah Mitchell. I watched the film and ironically, I was like, I see a lot of Raheem Mostert in this guy. Very fast. They use him on a lot of outside runs and they just continued to ask him to beat the edge defender off the corner. But I will say he's he's not, I don't think he's a great inside runner, Pierre Strong, but he's more elusive and he's better inside than Raheem Mostert. So I actually see a mix of Elijah Mitchell and Raheem Mostert when I watch Pierre Strong. This guy does have legit breakaway home run speed. Not that you need me to confirm it, but 437, God damn. All right. So Pierre Strong, very interesting prospect that you're going to be able to get at the end of third round, early fourth round in rookie drafts. No idea what his draft capital is going to be. Other thing to notice here is that he is 23 years old. So he's a little bit older on that side of things. Um, But Pierre Strong came away as a great athlete. He's like a glider. He is a really fast gliding type running back, which makes me feel like he's Raheem Mostert because Raheem Mostert is not overly elusive. But like when you're that fast, all you have to do is put on a tiny bit of change of direction, not a juke move, but a little bit of change of direction. And the inertia, because you're so fucking fast, puts defenders on skates. That's the kind of feeling I got with Pierre Strong. So very intriguing prospect after the combine. Now, Tyler Algier, I wouldn't necessarily say he's a loser because he weighed in at 5'11", 224 pounds, which is about what we expected. But he ran a 4'6'0". Now, 4'6'0 is by no means like a dagger in the back of a prospect. We've seen a lot of guys come in and run that type of 40 and and be fine in the NFL level. James Robinson, James Conner, Aaron Jones, like a lot of these guys come in and Kareem Hunt, it's, it's not a big deal. He is a lower percentile athlete. And for me, it kind of confirms what I saw when I took away or when I watched the film, what I took away from it. He had a lot of big explosive plays. He had a lot of 40, 50 yard touchdown runs. And my first takeaway was that he's very much Darrell Henderson, Chuba Hubbard, Tevin Coleman, straight up straight line runner that benefited from an elite offensive line with really, really shitty competition. And what that 4-6-0 tells to me is that those 40, 50 yard touchdown runs are fake. You're not getting those out of a guy that runs a 4-6 in the NFL, okay? It tells me that what I saw in film, the O-line and the poor defensive competition is exactly what Taj actually is, okay? Uh, and then when you have the burst score, you're starting to look at a pretty shitty athletic profile, okay? It's starting to look a little bit more like Josh Jacobs than it is James Robinson, because James Robinson was like a 90th percentile burst athlete, which is, again, is what piles up those eight to 15 to 20 yard runs consistently over and over and over again. This guy was rumored to run like a 4-4 in the 4-4-5, 4-4-7 kind of range. And this makes him not anywhere near the athlete that we saw he was. Again, doesn't mean he can't be James Conner, doesn't mean he can't be Carlos Hyde, but it does take away those top level comps where if you ran a 4-4-4, something like that, you could start looking at him as David Johnson or Antonio Gibson or Leonard Fournette or, or you know, even James Robinson, I think is kind of off the table because he lacks the burst that a guy like James Robinson had. Uh, so Tyler Algier, I would, you know, if I had to lean one way or another, it would be more towards a loser at the combine. Uh, Tyler Goodson was another guy who just fits into this mold where like, again, uh, 17 different Kenny Gainwells are in this class. Tyler Goodson, 5'9", 197, runs a 4'4'2", 76 percentile burst score, a uh, college target share in the 85th percentile. So a uh, pass catcher, a runner, undersized, could be a third down player with a lot of explosiveness. And then the last guy that I want to specifically point out before we get into more of the losers, Zamir White, man. Zamir White low-key might be the biggest winner of the combine. Six foot, 214. 440 yard dash. He has breakaway speed. We saw that on the film. So this isn't necessarily a huge. I mean, the 440 flat is a surprise, but the fact that he ran well is not a surprise. So 95th percentile speed score here, 64th percentile burst score. You're looking at a guy who is big, six foot, 214. He is a, he's not a grinder. He is definitely more in like the thumper role. He's definitely more of a power back than he is like a scat back or an elusive back, but he is very, very shifty and elusive low key for his size. He's not, again, he's not flashy, but he has, he has the moves, man. He's got the goods for a guy that's 215 pounds. So now you're looking at a size guy with four, four, zero speed, good burst, elusive, powerful. I think he's going to make a team very, 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 very happy. So Zamir White, big winner, zero involvement in the passing game, but this profile gives off more Damian Harris energy than any running back in the class right now. Size, speed, burst, I think he has a very real chance to be the next Damian Harris. So he is someone that you absolutely need to have on your radar in rookie drafts. Who else can we talk about? Kyron Williams was obviously the biggest loser here. And I wish I was more vocal about me not liking him because I was definitely on the side of like, he's way after the tier of second tier wide receivers where I was drafting him in like a 202, 203. He comes in at 59194. 
runs a 465 40 yard dash, 21st percentile burst score. Uh, I don't know, you know, if, if every if if all the prospects were not running the agility drills to prepare, I feel like he he accidentally prepared for the agility drills and thought he was running the 40 at his pro day because this shit is just I can't wait. The pro day is going to happen and then they're going to be like Kyron Williams just ran a 442, some fucking bullshit like that. But this was my concern. Everyone's like Kyron Williams RB1 in this class, RB3 in this class, RB4 in this class. I'm like, "Bro, he's probably 195 pounds." And everyone keeps comping him to Austin Eckler. And I cannot say this enough times. I know you guys are going to be like, "Shut the fuck up about this already." The problem is Austin Eckler is not Austin Eckler the way we see him unless Melvin Gordon holds out. Unless Melvin Gordon holds out, Austin Eckler never gets that three down workload. You never see guys like Austin Eckler become Austin Eckler's. It doesn't happen. NFL teams don't give a fuck about it, about you being a first and second down player with this type of size. So now you have an undersized 194 pound back. NFL teams are not going to use him on the first two downs. They'll use him in the third down situations now, okay? He's more Gio Bernard than he is Austin Eckler. And this proves it. Four, six, five. So now you're small. Now you're slow. Now you're not athletic. Like this is a big, big problem. So, you know, a lot of you guys are going to be like, I still like the film. That's fucking great. But uh, objectively, everybody can look at these numbers and know exactly what Kyron Williams is as a player. He's still a guy based on the profile and based on his third down prowess that you could probably use a late second round pick on him, early third round, depending on where the NFL draft capital is. Or probably some GMs that are like, I like the tape. I don't care about the combine like fucking morons. And maybe he gets higher draft capital than expected, but not a good look for Mr. Kyron Williams. Who else can we talk about? That was a winner or a loser. Uh, Damian Pierce came away eh, kind of exactly how I saw him coming away. He's an average athlete, you know. Uh, that's kind of what I thought he was going to be, but I, I still think he's going to be a much better pro than he was college level player. So I still very much like um, Damian Pierce. Devonte Price is a guy that I have to watch the tape on four three eight forty yard dash. So he's someone that was super productive in college. One other guy I want to talk about is Sincere McCormick because he got a lot of love pre combine. He was a guy that went to uh, Texas San Antonio, put up insane numbers, kind of like. Aaron Jones or Devin Singletary going to these smaller schools and putting up crazy, crazy production numbers. Now, there was a lot of comparisons to McCormick and Aaron Jones being this year's Aaron Jones. I like the film I saw on McCormick, and I could see why the comps were there. As soon as this was before, because this was a couple weeks ago, as soon as I dove into the actual advanced analytics, looking at PFF, you know, uh, premium stats, looking at Sports Info Solutions, advanced numbers, his numbers, since you're McCormick's numbers in terms of missed tackles forced, in terms of elusive rating, in terms of yards after contact, were horrible okay uh so objectively when you get the small school guys you can't tell how good they are because they're playing against shit competition once you start putting it all into relative numbers and advanced analytics and getting the combine numbers you start to get a better feel for who they are as players so since you're mccormick uh, i'm not surprised this was his combine because the advanced number said that he probably wasn't that good of a running back to begin with anyone else to talk on i don't believe so yeah, that's it. That's all I got for y'all today. Uh, who who do you guys who do you guys think came away winners or losers that I did not talk about? Because there was obviously like fifteen more dudes. I didn't touch on everybody. I touched on the guys that I thought actually moved a little bit in the rankings, or you know had big days or bad days or whatever. But there's probably like ten or twelve dudes that kind of did exactly what we thought they were gonna do. They are who we thunk they were. All right. Uh, so that's gonna wrap up today's video. If you are in dynasty leagues, people. We will be preparing you for your rookie drafts as well as Dynasty Startups. If you want to get into Dynasty Startups, we organize that for y'all, okay? All you got to do is go to bdge.store and sign up to be a big dog. Big dog community member or goat community member, which gets you premium access to me in a Discord where you could ask me any questions that you want. Um, Go sign up on bdge.store. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Hit the fucking D in the subscribe button, baby. And we are doing rookie and Dynasty content literally every single day of the week. Monday through Sunday, and then again, Monday through Sunday. So the bird right outside my window, I'm going to go say what up to him. Love y'all. Thumbs up if you enjoyed. See you guys on Friday.